there we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. JoLynn Mason, UW Combined Fund Drive Campaign Manager, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn. We're excited to see you in person and online. It's um, it's going to be a great presentation today. Um, as all you all know, every campaign season, we select one nonprofit that we feature um, that we hope will resonate with the community, and we try to highlight the work that they're doing and hope that we can share the message of the work and their mission with the broader UW community. And this year we've selected an incredibly well-known and incredibly amazing and well-respected organization, Doctors Without Borders. Um, most of us have heard of Doctors Without Borders um, and we probably have some idea about what they do, right? Doctors, war zones, blah, 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 unstable, uh, dangerous countries, all that kind of stuff, but they do so much more than that. Um, they are working in 70 countries, uh, more than 70 countries, nearly 500 missions, and serving more than a million people in the last year, which is pretty impressive. Um, and they are staffed by folks who are professionals in a variety of industries who are doing their work in places that they probably never thought they would be doing their work. And um, in circun under circumstances and in situations that um, are probably not what they're used to. And one of those folks we have with us today is Eileen Miller. Eileen has been working as an anesthetist, which I spent like 10 minutes practicing how to say that correctly, in Western Washington at Harborview Providence and Seattle Children's for the past 16 years. She first worked with Doctors Without Borders in 2014 in South Sudan. Since then, she's completed six missions to South Sudan and Liberia, all in maternal health or pediatric surgical projects. Eileen also travels several times a year with other organizations providing anesthesia, thought I can say, <laughs> in resource challenge settings. So please join me and welcome Eileen Miller. Screen now. Okay, great. Finally, Eileen Miller. Sorry for the technical difficulties. They were all me. Okay. Thanks. For, thanks for inviting me. And I love talking about MSF. Uh, I actually got involved with MSF um, because of another UW employee, Jerry Bashheim, um, who talked a whole. And you'll be hearing from him yes. November first. So um, anyway. Go ahead and get this started. And I'm replacing Karen Hester. So I'm. I'm actually, Karen Hester's fabulous. She works at Harborview. She's Pioneer um, Square Clinic and she's worked for MSF for years and she got called to Haiti um, just recently, like this week. So this is actually supposed to be her presentation. So I've, we've done a quick switch and um, I'm sorry that I haven't had a whole lot of prep time. But before I talk about my own experiences with MSF, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the principles of Doctors Without Borders. And also to let you know that we, when I say MSF, I mean Médecins Sans Frontières, which is the French uh, name for Doctors Without Borders. It simply means Doctors Without Borders in French. And so almost the entire world knows Doctors Without Borders by its French initials, which is MSF. And so I'm gonna be using MSF just out of habit, but know that I am talking about Doctors Without Borders. Uh, we provide emergency medical care to people caught in crises all around the world, and we work in more than 70 countries um, at any given time. And I'm just going to talk today about the various medical emergencies that we respond to and the way in which our organization responds and people who do this work. But MSF is as much as an organization, it's a movement, and it's based on um, several principles, um, the, um, the principles of um, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. And oh, there's no notes. Somehow these have, the slides have kind of reversed themselves, but in any case, so neutrality simply means that we don't take sides. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have an opinion. It doesn't mean that we don't, um, you know, have our own beliefs about something, but we don't take sides. That there's, we're often working in conflict zones. 50% of what we do is work in conflict zones, and we have to be able to care for both sides, any person who needs medical care um, within that context, as long as they're willing to leave their guns at the door, um, we will provide care. Um, in, uh, impartiality kind of, you know, some, kind of the same. Um, um, and then independence is really the, the 
the kind of the big thing that makes MSF different from a lot of other organizations is that we don't accept money from governments, um, or at least not from not from the US government. We accept a very, very small amount from um, the European Union, but almost all of our funding and all of our funding in the United States comes from independent donors. And it means that we don't have to be, we're not subject to anybody else's agenda. We don't, um, we're not called in and told to do something by a particular government. We can make our own assessment as to what the needs in that community are. Um, hang on. So, sorry, this is, looks a little bit different than it looked on my screen at home, but. Um, so different situations where MSF is responding, um, emergencies such as conflict. So Syria, um, South Sudan, the, the situation in um, Ethiopia and Eritrea um, is particularly in the last couple of years. 50% uh, of what we do is armed conflict. So if you work for MSF, you do have to, um, they'll, they'll never ask you to go someplace that you don't feel secure or safe, but um, you do have to recognize the fact that um, mo most of the time you will be in a conflict zone. So I'm realizing that if I, if I try to click through, it clicks through the slides rather than my notes, <laughs> sorry. Um, so epidemics and pandemics, I think everybody's really familiar with pandemics and really, really tired of pandemics right now, but um, MSF has always responded to various epidemics, um, Ebola, cholera, um, a lot of the, the little known diseases such as um, Kala Azar, sleeping sickness, Chagas, um, obviously HIV and tuberculosis have been um, a big part of our programs in a lot of different um, countries and particularly in the developing world. Um, refugees and internally displaced people. So especially now looking at the situation in Ukraine, we've got South Sudan, you've got the situation in Ethiopia, Syria, um, soon to be problems in Lebanon with the economic situation there. Um, here at our own back door, Venezuela, um, other people coming up from South and Central America fleeing, you know, various um, economic hardships as well as political and um, safety issues. So we've got a huge number of people in the world that are displaced both outside their countries and inside their countries. And MSF responds um, to, wor to working with um, medical needs as well as water and food insecurity. Um, I think there's now 80 million, and this uh, this presentation that, that I've got is from, I think, the end of 2021, and so at the end of that time, 80 million displaced people worldwide, and um, a year, a year later, I'm sure, with the situation on the ground in Ukraine and other places, that number is much, much higher. Um, a lot of people that are excluded from healthcare. So ne the neglected diseases, like I talked about, Kala Azar, which are you know things that you only see in in the developing world, um, Chagas, also prisoners um, working within the prison system, like caring for street children, um, and other people that have slipped through um, the medical systems. And then environmental disasters. These are the things that make headlines. You know, we hear about an earthquake, we hear about a hurricane. Um, they're actually a very small percentage of what we do. Um, but when, when they happen, we are able to respond. We're able to respond much, much faster if we're already in the country where that disaster has happened. So recently, a hurricane in Honduras, we were already on the ground in Honduras working with refugees that are um, um, heading north. Uh, and in Haiti, when the earthquake happened there, we had several projects already on the ground in Haiti. and. Um, so we were able to respond in Haiti um, very, very quickly because we were already already there. Um, in situations where we're not already in country, um, we are fairly um, nimble as far as being able to get people and um, humanitarian aid supplies to those places um, coming out of you know warehouses, uh, primarily in Europe and in Africa. So how do we respond now? I've never gotten to ride a motorcycle to any of my projects. So that's that's that looks a little bit more exciting than what I've done. I can tell you that the airplanes get progressively smaller the closer you get to the field. But um, in cer certain places, the 
you know, motorcycle is the, the uh, easiest way to get there. And I love this slide because I, while, while this isn't, isn't my slide, I looked at that picture and that's Nenny Deck. That's one of our South Sudanese physicians. And um, I worked with her a couple of years in South Sudan and she's wonderful. So when I saw that slide, it was like, oh, that's Nenny. So she's working in, in you know, just a picture of, you know, working in a clinic. And that is probably, a, I'm guessing, a vaccine, a, a vaccine polio, just it's oral. Uh, we have a huge um, reach. I mean, we're in 70 different countries. We've got um, more than 12.5 million medical consultations occurred in 2021 alone with vaccinations, treatment of infectious diseases, uh, malnutrition projects, epidemic responses for cholera, Ebola. We've currently got a, another Ebola epidemic breaking out in Uganda. That's um, We've uh, just started sending personnel to within the last month. Um, meningitis, measles. Measles is huge. Measles is one of the most infectious diseases in the, I mean, it make, makes um, COVID-19 look um, not infectious at all compared to measles. I mean, you can, you can walk into a room where somebody who had measles was an hour ago and catch measles if you're not immune. So, you know, that, that's a, um, uh, I've actually seen a couple of different measles epidemics or outbreaks in South Sudan when I was there, just working on a surgical project, and then you start getting a whole bunch of kids in with measles, and so then they, the vaccination clinics start. Uh, mental health support, I think, as a world, especially um, after the, you know, I, COVID-19 has done nothing else. It has kind of shown us that, you know, mental health is important. And so mental health support in particularly in conflict zones, um, people who have been displaced, people who have experienced violence, um, you know, especially in a lot of places, rape is used as a, a um, a war, it's, it's a war crime, but it's um, happening all over the world. Um, just the, uh, the mental consequences after natural disaster with war, um, I, our mental health professionals are, are starting to become more of a, at the forefront of things. And I think the whole world is recognizing that mental health is as important as physical health. Um, we do mature, reproductive and maternal health care. That's huge. Um, comprehensive medical and psychological care for victims of sexual and gender-based violence, and then also health promotion. So um, who, who works for MSF? Obviously, doctors without borders. So doctors, um, lots of nurses, pharmacists, physical therapists, um, lots of people in the medical field, um, anesthesiologists, nurse anesthetists, um, and that's what when people hear the, the term doctors of that borders, they assume doctors, but there is probably as much room, if not more, for other sorts of aid workers, so logisticians, um, human resources resources is huge. You know, people to working in the field with managing large, large groups of people because most of the people that MSF employs are uh, people that are hired within that country. So, you know, there'll be a very, very small group of expat, ex, what we call expat staff or international aid workers that have come in and um, a very, very large contingent. So it's like, it's like running a hospital or running a, a large corporation in a foreign country, you have to have people that are managing HR. So um, lots of need for that. Um, project coordinators, those are the people that oversee the all of the project. Um, epidemiologists who are looking not only at disease, but um, you know, looking at um, uh, you know, kind of mental health type uh, type economic. Um, So water and sanitation. So especially if you look at a refugee camp or a, a place for internally displaced people, you've got people that are working on water and sanitation, and also training people that are working in country because, you know, that's that's the most sustainable is to have people who are, who are from that country, uh, working there. So so finance, human resources, admin professionals. So there's a there's a huge need and a huge role for. 
people like that within MSF. So if you're not medical, um, don't think automatically that, that you can't work for MSF. We're welcome you with wide open arms. Um, so all of the positions that I just mentioned are filled by professionals found locally, not just international staff sent to countries for a limited period of time. So besides medical staff, doctors, nurses, ad, and then also the admin and the project coordinators, we've also got local mechanics who keep the vehicles running, um, translators, hospital cleaners, guards, watchmen, and all the essential roles that keep MSF running. So if you look at um, the MSF by the numbers, the locally hired staff, so these are people that are, we call them national staff, meaning they're, they're working for MSF within their own country, about 83%. And that number is probably going to grow as we're looking at how MSF is evolving in the future, that the national staff is gonna be a, a bigger part of, of um, this pie chart. Um, headquarters staff, 9%, and that number is probably actually going to drop a little bit as we're um, focusing more on move, on decentralizing and moving things uh, closer to where the actual work is being done. So having headquarters in Africa, as opposed to only having headquarters in Europe and the United States. Um, international staff, that's about 8%. And international staff is what is what I am. It's, it's what re we refer to as expat. Um, or expatriate, meaning you're working for an organization outside of your country of origin. And this includes people that are that were locally hired staff, um, such as local physicians, um, local nurses. There's an anesthetist that I work with frequently in South Sudan, Nicola. I'll show a picture of him later. He actually goes out of South Sudan and he's been to Liberia and to Darfur um, and he goes as an expat staff. So he's able to provide care um, to people outside of, of his own country. And in fact, the anesthetist that I took over for and who took over for me when I left South Sudan the last time was a fellow from Cameroon. So these are people that have, have started off working for MSF within their own countries and then are able to transfer around um, as, as the need arises, making MSF uh, fairly flexible. So um, how are we funded? Individuals, 94% of our funding comes from individuals who make small donations. You know, it might be $25, it might be $100, it might be $1,000, but these are just individual donations, not corporations, um, not governments. And uh, it's like foundation, you know, there's a, a few foundations that um, 3%, corporations 3%, and the rest of it's individuals. So the individual donor is our most important resource. And that means, and, and if people make an unrestricted, and almost everybody makes an unrestricted donation, you, you can't, people can make a donation that's specifically for a particular, you know, like the Haiti earthquake or hurricane in Honduras, but most donations are made unrestricted. And that means that MSF can use them wherever the need is, is greatest and not, and not restricted. So support from individuals ensures that we can reach more people more quickly and save more lives. So expenditures, we try to keep the administrative expenditures as low as possible. Um, believe it's fundraising is 14% of our, it's probably our biggest uh, expenditure. Management's fairly low, 1% and 85% goes directly to the field and to programs. So I'm gonna talk the, I've, I've been to a couple of different projects. I've been to a wheel South Sudan five times and I've been to Liberia, um, to Monrovia once. So the project that I'm gonna talk mostly about is a wheel South Sudan because that's that was my, my first MSF assignment and it's where I've been the most and it's kind of where my heart is. Uh, MS, a wheel was started in 1987 and it was, um, in response to a maternal death emergency, there were so many women dying in childbirth. There was very, very little um, maternal health care, and it was it's in a fairly rural part of what then was Sudan. So remember, South Sudan is the world's newest country. In 2012, they finished a brutal civil war that was waged between the north part of the of Sudan and the south part of Sudan, and as a result, in 2012. Um, 
there was an agreement and South Sudan is its own country with its own government. And um, the Republic of Sudan is what was once um, the Northern part of Sudan. So this, this project was started in what was once Sudan and is now South Sudan. Um, as you can see that at sunrise, it's actually quite beautiful. It's, um, there's nothing quite like an African sunrise. And this is a project that's kind of a little bit of, and if you know the children's book, if you give a pig a pancake, it's sort of morphed into, it started off a maternal health, um, providing um, uh, obstetric care for women and being able to provide a cesarean section as needed. But um, once you provided women's health, well, now sometimes you have premature infants. And so you start taking care of a few premature infants. And then, well, if you're caring for premature infants, well, that family has other children and those other children show up. And then somebody comes in and they burned themselves and somebody else comes in and they've broken their femur. And then the malaria season happens. And so now you've got a whole bunch of children that have shown up with malaria. And so this project went from being a obstetric project to a obstetric and pediatric project. And it is like most MSF projects, it is in cooperation with the Ministry of Health within that country. So we run several programs out of the Awil Civil Hospital, which is the main um, healthcare facility for the, the whole, it's, it's a very, very large state in South, in South Sudan but, um, and very, very rural. So we run the pediatrics. So anybody under, four, under the age of 14 and we run the obstetric and maternal health uh, project there. So the caseload for obstetrics is um, C-sections and C-section is the most common surgical procedure performed in an MSF project, hands down. Um, any surgeon who works for MSF really needs to be able to perform a C-section. And um, we, we only do C-sections with MSF for maternal indications. Um, you know, so placenta previa, obstructed labor, a prior C-section, post-fistula repair. And the reason for that is that any C-section done um, puts that woman at risk in the future with a future delivery, and she probably will have future children, and she may or may not be able to be in a hospital when she delivers. And if a woman has had a C-section, there's risks um, of the uterus rupturing with a subsequent labor. Um, things like placenta previa are more common. Things like placenta percreta, increta, and accreta where um, if you're not delivering in a hospital, you, the woman is going to have a hemorrhage and, and die. So the only reason that we do C-sections are for maternal indications, and it is to save the life of the mother um, or to, to save her from, if it's you know, an obstructed labor and the fetus is, the, the infant is still alive, then she'll get a C-section because that saves her from the complications of uh, obstetric fistula later on, on down the road. Um, ectopic pregnancies are, and in a, the developing world context, an ectopic pregnancy usually presents as a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, which is an emergency. It's somebody who's hemorrhaging to death. Um, in this country, we, you know, people get an early scan, and if the pregnancy is intrauterine, um, everything's great. But if you've got a positive pregnancy test and no intrauterine pregnancy, you suspect an ectopic pregnancy, and you can and you can treat that prior to it rupturing. But in a place like South Sudan, a woman only knows that she's pregnant. She doesn't know that the, that the pregnancy is actually intrauterine until it ruptures um, and um, then it becomes an emergency. And usually these women, women come in, I, you know, the hemoglobins were four, which is a hem hematocrit of 12, which you know a, a normal hematocrit for a healthy, say 28 year old woman would be about 28%. So, um, it's it's truly an emergency. Molar pregnancies, which um, present very, very late in this context, those are where you've got just abnormal placenta. You don't have, there's not a pregnancy, there's not a, there's not an embryo, but there is a lot of abnormal placenta. Um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage happens. Um, breast abscesses are really, really common. Um, we do a lot of family planning, so we provide birth control, both in the, you know, in the form of IUDs, as well as the hormonal birth control that can be inserted into the arm. Um, we also provide safe abortion care. Um, obstetric fistula, there's um, 
periodically there will be surgeons that can, are able to come through and we'll have a fistula clinic or to be able to get women the care that they need to, to um, repair you know, what is really a life altering condition. Um, and cervical cancer surgery and um, the HPV vaccine. And that, that project right now is in Malawi. So um, being able to get the HPV vaccine out to the world would be a, a game changer as far as preventing cervical cancer all over the world. This is our maternity hospital in, South, in, in a wheel. It's, um, this is a fairly new facility. It was actually built by the Canadian government in anticipation of the World Health Organization using it. And they came through and were unable to, um, they, what they thought they were gonna be able to do was to take over the obstetric project and they simply weren't able to do that. So the, the uh, facility has been turned over and being used by MSF and it's great. It's a new clean facility, um, puts the obstetric care right across the hall or the vestibule from the operating rooms, which is great for emergency C-sections and, um, And here's one of our midwives. That's um, she's actually from she's an Australian who's been working in Georgia for about thirty years, and she does a lot with MSF. And that's the labor board. Um, here's this woman I, as a kind of a, a, a fun story. She came in and she was having a repeat cesarean section for probably what was her seventh or eighth child. And when any woman has a cesarean section, they are always offered the option of a tubal ligation at the same time. Not something that we push, but it is an option. That is, you know, if you're going to do a cesarean section, you give the woman that option because that prevents her from possibly going on to having another pregnancy and labor and delivery out in the village or in a conflict zone where she can't get medical care and where she might have an emergency. And you know, any woman who dies generally leaves behind, you know, five, six, seven children, and those children don't do as well without a mother. So our focus is entirely on the health of the mother. So when she was offered a tubal ligation, she readily took us up on it. She was like, yep, that's exactly what I want. But now, in most countries um, that are a little bit more traditional, there's oftentimes people are asking for and wanting the permission of the husband. Or in some cases, it might not even be the husband, it might just be any male relative who can give permission. And one of the OR staff who was, a, who was national staff, who was fairly traditional, wanted to know as we were getting started, you know, was the permission given by the husband? And this woman spoke right up and she said, I don't need any permission. I'm having this. So it was, this was great. And so this is her very, very happy the next day with her brand new baby daughter. And um, it was just kind of a nice, healthy twins that, that, uh, were delivered um, just, I don't know, eye candy for the picture. <laughs> They're adorable. Yeah. Okay, so pediatrics. So pediatrics is a, also a huge part of the project in a wheel. And um, these cute little guys were roaming the inpatient ward. Only one of them was a patient, the little boy in the striped shirt. He's uh, actually a type one diabetic and spent quite a bit of time in the hospital there. But that's his, we, we always said that's Quatch and his posse as they were running around the hospital. Um, the, as far as the pediatric caseload goes, huge medical, um, probably more medical than surgical as far as, as the, um, the caseload, depending on the time of year, malaria. And starting in April when the rains start and malaria, the caseload increases by 400%, you know, huge number of, of children with malaria and cerebral malaria. So um, we become very, very busy and the hospital actually expands into tents at that point. Diarrheal diseases, you know, anywhere, children, children everywhere in the world, particularly in the developing world, you know, with the lack of access to clean water. Meningitis is common, pneumonia. Um, diabetes, of, of all things, is it, there's a genetic component and um, type one diabetes is very, very common in South Sudan. And so we, we were seeing quite a few children with, um, diabetic ketoacidosis. So our surgical um, caseload, which is kind of where I get involved, I don't have much to do with the medical side of things, as I give anesthesia. Um, burns is huge. Most of the most of places um, around the world are cooking over open fires, and so kids 
manage to get them to stumble into the open fires, you know, or big pots of soup get pulled over and scalding, scald injuries. So a large number of burns, abscess, um, and something called pyomyositis, which is where the muscle, um, basically the muscle becomes the abscess, um, is fairly common. Um, just, you know, bug bite, scratching, um, fractures, uh, really, really common, especially, you know, in, a, in the countries with lots and lots of children. Um, peritonitis, so appendicitis, uh, typhus. Um, typhus is fairly common, and so you have what's called a typhus perforation. Um, that happens fairly frequently. Um, volvulus, which is a twisting of the bowel. Um, there is absolutely no laparotomy that is, that is um, routine when, when you're seeing it in a developing world setting like that. Um, saw some congenital malformations like Invalisil that we repaired. Snake bite. Typically, it'll be a six or seven year old girl who's helping her family out and she reaches into a dark cupboard and she gets bit by a snake. And that um, unfortunately results in if they survive the snake bite and get to us, um, which is most, most of the time, but um, lots and lots of tissue necrosis. And so requiring surgical care for um, debriding and skin grafting for the necrosis. Um, accidents. Like anywhere in the world, probably accidents are the most common, you know, so car accidents, kids getting hit by, by the cars, um, sports injuries, falls from trees, kind of all of the typical kid stuff. And then there's the stuff, that, the kids that stick things in their noses and ears. That happens everywhere in the world. And <laughs> so sometimes they get an anesthetic so that we can get them quiet enough in order to get whatever it is that they've stuck in their nose or stuck in their ear out. Uh, this is a a, di a diabetes education workshop being run by our pharmacist who was talking to the families um, about diabetic care. And, and, di and type 1 diabetes is really, really difficult to treat in a country where people don't have access to refrigeration. So you know, insulin needs to be stored in the refrigerator. Oftentimes, they're, they would take it, the vial home, put it in a clay pot, which they would put in a, another clay pot filled with water, cool water to keep it cool, and in a hole in the floor of their too cool to try to keep it cool. Um, but a lot of education went into high protein diets versus carbohydrates and kind of going back to how diabetes was treated, unfortunately, around the turn of the century in this country, the, the turn of the prior century when, you know, before the, the um, before we had insulin to treat it, when diabetics simply had to adhere to a very, very high protein diet. Uh, this is our emergency room. It was, this was a, this was newly built the last time I was there. And um, I don't know how I got a picture of it without any patients in it, but that was a pretty rare occurrence. And this is for all of the under 14s would come through here. And um, the maternity, like any emergency room anywhere in the world, nobody wants to see a pregnant woman in the emergency room. They get straight to obstetrics. So it was really just the, the children, the under 14s that we'd see in the emergency room. This is the hallway outside our inpatient ward. And I, it's not usually that, it's not really that wide. I think I stretched the photo to try to make it look better on the slide. <laughs> um, during malaria season um, or just in a, in a busy time, that hall will be full of mattresses with children on them. This is our intensive care unit. And by intensive care, it just means that we have a little bit better nursing ratio to the patients and we had oxygen concentrators in there. So anybody requiring oxygen could get oxygen. You see a lot of what looks like adults in the beds and that's because that's a parent sleeping in the, with a child in their bed. Um, the parents were there you know, caring, caring for their children. It's, it's not a hospital like in the US where you can leave your loved one and know that nursing staff is going to take care of them. Um, in a context like this, there, there just isn't enough resources to have the patients cared for only by the nursing staff. So they always have a family caregiver that's with them that helps them feed and toilet and bathe. And, um, and then the, the nursing and the medical staff is responsible for medications and you know any kind of medical care that they need. This is a whole world full of children in skin traction. This is uh, mango season or mango fall out of tree season. So about February, when the mangoes start getting ripe and the kids are hungry and the mangoes are delicious, the kids will climb the mango trees. And um, it, this results in kind of end of January, February, a huge influx of kids with fractures. There's really no way to, you know, surgically here in the US, we would just, we would put a nail in the femur and they would go home in a couple of days. 
we don't have the resources to be able to do that there. And the risk of infection putting orthopedic hardware in, in those conditions would be extremely high. So the kids end up on the ward for about six weeks in what's called skin traction. So we, um, and then the femur heals. And once the femur is in good alignment, the pain is really pretty minimal. And uh, the kids actually kind of have, have fun, you know, they're, they can't get out of bed, but they're sort of playing with each other in bed. Um, at one point I had to take sticks away from them because they were poking their neighbors. <laughs> so, but, uh, but it's a, it's a long time and it's a big time commitment for that family who, you know, a mother or a, a caregiver has to stay with the child. And there are probably five or six other children at home. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a big time commitment. This little guy, um, he's about nine, and this is just a this is a sports injury. He's a, he was playing soccer with his his buddies. Soccer is a really really popular sport in South Sudan. Most of the world they call it football, but it's um, the most popular sport anywhere in the world. And he got kicked in the belly by one of his friends playing soccer. And you wouldn't think that a kick in the belly would result in a, a ruptured spleen, but if you've had malaria and you've got an enlarged spleen you're much higher risk of, of having a rupture. So indeed he did. Um, so he came to us about seven o'clock in the evening and got an emergency laparotomy and took his, removed his spleen, um, gave him a unit of blood. And this is him less than 24 hours after surgery, walking around the compound with his mother. He said, you know, talk about strong, you know, brave kids. He was, he was great. Um, and he was also really excited to see the picture of his spleen in the kidney basin. He thought that, that was cool. <laughs> So this, this little boy has a story. This is Yelgarang, and he's about eight months old. And in South Sudan, it's often 120 degrees, but in December and January, it's cold. And at night, the temperatures drop down into the 70s. We think of that as very, very pleasant, but there it's cold and there is no central heating. There's, you can't just turn up the thermostat. So people are heating their tukuls or their compounds with open fires. And any good mother wants to keep her child warm, right? So she had put the bed that the baby was on near the fire. And he's about eight months old and they're kind of squirmy at eight months old. And he woke up and nobody was around and um, he squirmed and he fell off the bed into the fire that was right next to his bed. And it was several minutes before somebody was able to get him out of the fire. And I'm an old burn nurse. I've worked at Harborview since 1994, you know, first as a registered nurse on the burn ICU and then, you know, currently as a, an anesthetist in the OR. So um, he was badly injured. He had about a 40% burn, which at Harborview would not be, you know, it would be a very survivable burn at Harbor. 40% is, you know, we see it all the time. Um, and it, this, the, Here. that's talking. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know what it is, but yeah, he's talking right here. So, um, but even at Harborview, he would have lost his right arm. He had a fourth degree burn to the right arm, which meant a burn that went all the way through the tissue to the bone. And so even at Harborview, he would have lost his right arm. So, and a 40% burn is almost for sure a fatality in, in a country like South Sudan. He, um, so when we talked to his family, I made sure that the family knew that there was no wrong answer, there was no wrong decision, that they had to make the decision as to what we were going to do with him that was the best decision for their family. Because if we were going to treat him and if he survived, he was going to be with us for several months and they were going to have to have a caregiver there. And he was going to need blood transfusions for skin grafting. And that was going to require getting people to come from the village to donate blood. I mean, this, this was a, a big outlay. Plus, they had other children. And so to be able to put this, you know, that much family resource into one child who may or may not survive. Um, but we also let them know that if they so chose that we would take care of him, we would do everything we possibly could do to save his life and to give him the best chance. If they chose to let him go, that we would keep him very, very comfortable until he did so. Um, after much discussion, and they had to go back to the village and talk to the village, the, the village leaders, because no decision in South Sudan is ever made individually by a family. You, you talk to, your, to all of your family members. They decided that they wanted to treat him. So we had him for several months, and this is him probably a month into treatment. He, um, he rallied with um, a lot of good care, and um, we, we had to do skin grafting sequentially. We couldn't do a big graft all at once because there, you know, it would, 
he had to do small parts um, to allow him time to recover in between. You know, at Harborview, we would have, he, he would have probably been, you know, out of the hospital in about three weeks. With us in South Sudan, he was there about three months. Um, but ultimately, this is him about the, the week before he went home. So had a, he'd had some burns on the left arm as well. So it was a split to try to prevent contractures and um, you know, all of his skin graft sites. I, it looks, they still look, but you know, that's partially because of the loss of pigment in his skin. Uh, but he, he healed up well and that's him with his mother about the week before he went home. Here's my OT crew in the rest of the world, we call it the operating theater, not the operating room. And um, this is only part of them. There's probably about 20 people that work in the operating room there. Anyway, it's a, it's a great group of people. My, my colleague, Nicola, is the second from the right. He's one of the, um, the national staff anesthetists and he's fabulous. So thank you. Um, we'll just open it up for questions. All right. Um, does anybody in the room have any questions? Uh, if we look over the one slide with the two machines in the back, we're looking to find options that what, uh, what was it when the ICU slide? Oh, the, yes, those were oxygen concentrators. If I can go back. Yeah, I noticed that oh. you had several things plugged Here. into like yes, like cords plugged into cords. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that um, the the physical facilities people at Harborview would not have allowed this. <laughs> <laughs> but but yes, there were cords plugged into cords, and all of these are oxygen concentrators. Um, running to those various beds. And we use an oxygen concentrator in the operating room too, my anesthesia machine. We didn't have compressed gas. We had an oxygen concentrator. So um, that's what we used in the operating room as well. Uh, if anybody online has a question, you can drop it in the chat and I will ask the speaker. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What um, what prompted you to get involved with Doctors Without Borders and like kind of do this international work? It seems like well, I, I it's had, an interesting. Yeah, I had started off as a, um, before I went back to school for anesthesia, I'd started off doing some organizations like Operation Smile and doing some short-term medical missions. And that was fun. It was a great way to see the world and meet people and to meet people as other than a tourist. So you're kind of meeting people where they're at. Um, and then the earthquake happened in Haiti. And I went and spent some time working at the tent hospital at the airport in, in Port-au-Prince and kind of decided that I really liked some of that urgent kind of work. And then Jerry Basheim gets the, the blame for um, getting me involved in MSF. Jerry's an anesthesiologist that worked at the University of Washington for years. He's retired and you guys will get to hear him on November 1st, I believe, and yep. he's going to have a great presentation. And he was always a, a really good ambassador for MSF. And he got a couple of us, um, of the, the nurse anesthetists at Harborview involved. And we've gone off and, and done missions and stayed involved with MSF. So um, so basically, it was it was Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have another kind of random question. Mm -hmm. What is a nurse anesthetist versus an anesthetist or anesthesiologist? anesthesiologist. Yeah. So um, in the United States, we have um, to actually, we have three different ways that people give anesthesia. So the first is as a physician anesthesiologist. So it's somebody who goes to medical school, then does a residency in, in anesthesia, um, and then provides anesthesia. Um, the second is as a nurse anesthetist, which is actually the first because when anesthesia, I mean, anesthesia is, surgery is much older than anesthesia. As you can imagine, that's pretty awful. Um, but when when there was first anesthesia, the people that provided anesthesia were nurses, you know, before there was an actual physician specialty in anesthesia. So my background is I went to nursing school. I had a bachelor's degree in nursing. I worked for 14, 15 years as an, as an intensive care nurse and then as a flight nurse for Air Force West. And then I went back to school um, for a master's degree in, you know, specifically in anesthesia training. And so then I provide anesthesia. And then the third way is relatively new and it's called an anesthesia assistant. And there, you, you really only see them in about 22 of the United States, but they are people that are not physicians, not nurses, but people who just get anesthesia training and then provide anesthesia. And they provide anesthesia under the direction of an anesthesiologist. A nurse anesthetist sometimes provides anesthesia under the direction of an, of an anesthesiologist and um, sometimes pr uh, provides anesthesia completely independently, depending on where you work. When I work at Harborview, I'm working in, a, in an anesthesia care team. When I work up at Everett, I'm working independently. 
So, but my background is as a art, we do ex the same thing. We provide anesthesia, the anesthetic looks the same, um, but I am a nurse as opposed to a physician. Uh -huh. Okay, well, the, the question is, um, do, is MSF always in countries that are supportive of the work that MSF is doing or, um, so do we have to have the blessing of that government to be there? Well, that's certainly easier. <laughs> um, and I, I can't speak to, I know that there are situations because I know of the projects that are in countries where the government is not supportive and the, the projects are, um, there, there's one in the Nuba Mountains just across the border. While, while we did start off working in the Republic of Sudan when it was all one big country um, after 2012, I, I don't believe there's any projects in the Republic of Sudan except for this project in the Nuba Mountains that's just across the border and it can be. And then there are there are countries, so Syria is a place where you, you can't necessarily run a specifically an MSF project where you start a hospital and you, um, but you can support the the national staff, the local staff, people who are in MSF will pay them and can get in medications and supplies. A lot of that was has been what's happening in Ukraine. Um, there's, you know, supporting supporting the local staff because there's there, there's good medical infrastructure in that country, but you know they're short on things. So yes. <laughs> hey, the, the question is with the as far as the tubal ligation goes if the woman is consenting to it but the husband is not um i have not seen a situation where if the husband is not consenting the woman does not it, it's a um it, it, it's a really difficult, really, really difficult situation. We had a, a woman who was hemorrhaging after a vaginal delivery and she needed a hysterectomy. And um, she would not consent to go to the operating room because her husband wouldn't consent because without a uterus, he did not feel that she was as valuable to him. And finally, he was told that, um, oh, he's, well, he finally told her that fine, go have the hysterectomy, but I will be getting another wife. And staff finally told him that, well, he would be getting another wife anyway, because without the hysterectomy, she would die. So it, it does get a little bit, um, and, and that's not a situation that happens all that often. I mean, for the most part, people are, you know, we, we can, we can say, well, you know, this paternalistic, but for the most part, people are, you know, husbands love their wives and wives want to live. And it, it generally works out. <laughs> sure. Sure, um, well, I can tell you about a day in the life in a wheel. So a wheel is a is a hot you know, like say it's a project that's been running since 1987. So when anybody goes there, you go in basically. I don't if, if anybody's medical here, you go in basically as a locums. So you're not going in as a specific team. You're not going in with a group of people that you all went in together. I go in and I replace an anesthetist that's there. A surgeon will go in and replace a surgeon that's there. A nurse will go in and replace another nurse. So it's all, you know, it's a facility that's run by long-term locums. So, you know, it's a, it's a hospital running like any other hospital. So um, I get up in the morning and generally have in a, in a wheel, everybody kind of has breakfast about the same time, about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning have breakfast. There's usually a short, you know, team, you know, team brief, you know, this is what's going on. Once a week, there's a security brief because 
you know, there's, there's always, you know, security situations. In a wheel, we're lucky in that we can walk to the hospital. It's about a 10 minute walk through the market, which is really kind of nice. Um, so either walk as a team to the hospital or by my, you know, depending on what time you're going, you know, sometimes I'll need to be there earlier or later. Um, huh? No worries. No motor, no motor. In fact, not allowed to ride a motorcycle. MSF has a, a, um, a very strict policy where you don't get in any other vehicle other than an MSF vehicle. And that's that's for safety because, you know, taxis, motorcycles, tuk-tuks, not necessarily the safest. So if you're in a vehicle, it's an MSF vehicle. So, or you're on foot. <laughs> um, and then you get to the hospital and in our project in a wheel, there was always a list of, you know, 12 or 14 or 16 kids that needed some kind of a small surgical procedure. And so the vast majority of what I was doing in the operating room there with pediatrics was um, things like wound care, kids needing sedation for um, changing their burn dressings or for setting a fracture or for lancing an abscess or, um, you know, just kind of any number of things where kids would need station for. And then we also had a surgeon. So, you know, you know, with several times, you know, depending on the day, sometimes you'd have two or three, you know, major operations, you know, whether it be a, a laparotomy for the, you know, but they were typically emergent, you know, the, we, we didn't do anything elective. There, there wasn't people coming in for, you know, surgical procedures that were elective. Everything that was done was urgent or emergent. So, you know, an appendicitis or a, what else, had a testicular torsion, um, can have an ovarian torsion, the splenectomy, the, the women coming in with the ruptured um, ectopic pregnancies. But th the day would kind of start off with, you've got this schedule that you, you've got all of these kids that you need to make sure that they were appropriately NPO when they came to the operating room. Um, and they would get typically, a, you know, like a, a ketamine, ketamine's a great drug. Uh, ketamine anesthetic, you know, just just enough to kind of get through it. You, you know, what are typically 10, 15 minute procedures just to, to get them through it. Um, I typically didn't have time to get back to base. Where, where we lived, we called the compound or base, um, you know, where lunch was served. So I'd pack myself a, a sandwich and peanut butter and a pita bread and um, eat at the hospital. And then, you know, depending on emergencies and what the schedule looked like in the afternoon, head back. Um, we had people that cooked for us, so didn't have to, you know, that that was nice. Didn't have to deal with with any of, you know, meal preparation or anything. Um, we had people that cooked, and so if you got back late, the, you know, it was it was left in the kitchen for you to to warm up. Um, there was, you know, it's a a very very international team. I mean, I think. The largest team that I was ever there with was probably 23, 24 people. And there were people from Korea, from Japan, from Sweden, from all over, all over Africa. So several people from Kenya had um, the uh, med ref was from Cameroon. Um, so uh, people from Australia, New Zealand, um, and, and then of course, Europe. You know, a, a, you know, heavy contingent from Europe, uh, you know, and a few others from the United States. So a really, really international team of people to hang out with, you know, you know, if there was time playing cards, um, oh, playing, uh, oh, bananagrams, but playing in your, playing bananagrams, but you got to play it in your second language. <laughs> <laughs> I could barely play bananagrams in my first Ex language. Exa exactly. It got a little bit challenging. So, you know, so you meet people from all over. So, I mean, the day, it, was, it was a typical day like you would have here. You'd get up, have breakfast, go to work, come home, have dinner, whatever uh, recreation, recreation in the evening. Um, well, thank you. I want to respect your time, Eileen. Thank you so much for coming today. Yeah. yeah. Um, online and in person applause. Um, I'm, I'm going, going to, to pause the recording, the but if anybody wants to drop a question in the chat, you're welcome to do that. Those that are here, you're welcome to ask more questions. So we stop recording? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah you're good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>